This is the In Context Podcast with your host, Karen Von Hippel. So I'm Karen Von Hippel, the Director General of RUSI, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this next episode of my podcast called In Context. For those of you who've been listening, we've been on a bit of a break because of the pandemic, but uh, we're back up and we will be recording these now every few weeks. This is the first time that I've done it with the virtual tools, so we hope you will bear with us in case we make any mistakes along the way. But today it's really a pleasure to introduce and welcome Sir Mark Rowley, who is a retired senior British police officer, who many of you will likely know. He served as the National Police Lead for Counterterrorism, and he was the Assistant Commissioner in the Metropolitan Police Service from August 2014 to 2018. And importantly, he is a Distinguished Fellow at RUSI. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Karen. It's great to have you here today. And I really enjoyed reading through your bio and thinking through a number of issues that I wanted to talk to you about today. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Let me start out by saying, you know, when, when reading through your bio, you certainly do not fit the stereotype of the police officers that, that you see on television. You are a Cambridge graduate, Cambridge undergrad, and, and you have a master's from Cambridge. You do yoga. How many, how many other police officers fit that bill? Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm weird. But I, think, I think people who work with me know I'm, I'm a bit weird. I had this moment when I was 17 when I decided the only thing I wanted to do in my life was be a police officer. And I sort of, I was bored one lunchtime at school and I was flicking through some leaflets in what my school, um, I went to Hansworth Grammar School in Birmingham, State Grammar School, and what my school laughably called the careers office. It was, it was more covered with some leaflets in it. And I was looking at this leaflet on, and I was doing sort of maths and science CA levels, and I was looking at this leaflet on um, forensic science. I think, oh, that's, that's quite interesting. And then I just had this moment, I know, I'll join the police. And I just... Literally put that leaflet down, thought, I'll, I'll go to university, do what I enjoy most, which happened to be maths, because I have a, a few geeky tendencies. And um, at the end of Cambridge, I applied to join the police. So it was, a sort of, it, was a, it was just based on that one moment, I was absolutely certain that was the right thing for me. I, I, I didn't really understand it then, but I think it was, it was the combination of wanting something that would give me more connection to, I guess, real life and real issues than I was a fairly, sort of, I guess, naive middle-class grammar school kid. And secondly, the sense that it'd be worthwhile as well as being interesting and sort of it lived up to it all the way through. That's so interesting. I mean, normally, it, I don't know, you know, in the UK as much as in the US, but I mean, often you find people's parents were police officers or fathers or their grandfathers or uncles. Did you have any of that in your family? No, no policing in the family at all. It was so I was completely left field. My, my dad ran a small engineering business. My mom had been a teacher till she gave it up when um, she had me and my brother. So it was a bit of a random family idea. And you were not addicted to any of the police shows on TV? Not particularly, no. I, I sort of, it just, I, I don't quite know where this sort of Damascan moment quite came from, but oh. sort of, it was definitely, I, I loved it all the way through. I mean, it was, it was, there were some shocks in it. I mean, so I think just going from being a Cambridge undergrad and sort of um, a few months later, walking the beat in the centre yeah. of Birmingham was a sort of an eye-opener in lots and lots of ways. But um, yeah, it was fantastic. And I loved that. I loved that all the way through to my later jobs. It was it was great. Well, we'll get to that in a minute about being the Bobby on the beat. And in fact, I have to say that the stereotype of the police officer anyway didn't fit for me. Uh, I mean, the first police officers I met in this country were pretty much like you, very educated, very curious, etc. So I think uh, that stereotype was bashed for me about 20 years ago. But it still is kind of funny when you watch some of these pop shows on TV, which I, of course, love. I'm totally addicted to all of them. I think if I had to do it over again, I would have become a cop because I do like the problem-solving aspect of it, right? It's great. And it's nice to be sort of, it's doing problem-solving and sort of in the raw as well in the sense of sort of, because policing operates where society breaks. So you're meeting people at their, at their best and their worst. You're meeting sort of, I know, victims and families in the most awful situations. And you're meeting sort of ghastly dangerous and often sad people who have become offenders and so, so, so you're, you're there at that sort of fracture point in society and that's fascinating exhilarating and exhausting and depressing and exciting and sort of it's it's, a, it's extremes the but full range of emotions but you also see when you're helping people too very quickly don't you I and mean, that must be very satisfying oh it's immensely satisfying you know you made a difference for a particular person as a 
as a PC or as a young detective, whatever it might be, actually, you sort of, you know, you did your bit. And that's, that's not to pretend it's all perfect. I mean, policing is a big, messy organisation, but that sort of sense of vocation, I think, and it still strikes me, it's sort of, when I was later on, when I was a, a chief and I used to do sort of the sort of swearing in ceremony, um, ceremony for new police officers and after that meeting, sort of chatting with some of them and their parents, the sense of most police joiners that this looks exciting and interesting. So there's, there's a bit of ego in there, but also this looks worthwhile and I can make a difference. That Those two sort of motivations cropped up with almost every conversation I would ever have with a new recruit. And you can tell whether people feel they're, sort of, they're saying what they ought to say to a senior officer or, or whether they really mean it. And, and you can tell generally people mean it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Now let's talk a bit about being a Bobby on the beat. You said in Birmingham, right? When you were mm -hmm. maybe in your early yeah. 20s, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yes. Straight out of early Cambridge. Late, okay, straight out of Cambridge. So just encountering very different types of people. What were the bigger challenges then? What kinds of things were you dealing with? Was it drugs? Was it petty crime? What kinds of things were you? So I, was, I started in the town centre, so it was shoplifting, street robberies, and nighttime alcohol-related violence. I mean, sort of, there was almost nobody, at that stage, almost nobody lived on the pack. So there was sort of, in the centre of Birmingham that we covered, so, so there was barely a domestic burglary to, to deal with, in the sense of, because there were no houses. But there was a lot, so, so it was a sort of very sort of rough and ready sort of town centre environment. And that was great fun, frankly. Um, that's sort of been a good education in life. I sort of, I, one of the things that strikes me is how much policing has moved. In the way policing today worries about crime statistics and performance and accountability and all those sorts of issues, in hindsight, there was no trace of that then. Mm -hmm. No trace of that at all. And um, I tell you, this is a slightly awful story, but the first time I picked up any interest in how much crime there actually was, and that was, the police should be interested in the, trying to help there be less crime. The first time I, I picked up any interest in it was when one of the old sweats on the shift organised a sweepstake approaching Christmas as to what the final number would be at the end of the year of the number of crimes. It only struck me subsequently that seemed an odd that before that point, there never been anything, or well, never been a briefing where someone said, we're really worried about, and a burglary's gone up on this side of the division and we need to, we're going to do X, Y, and Z about it, or violence has gone up in relation to this nightclub and therefore blah, blah, blah. There was not, there was none of that. It was much more rough and ready and reactive. And it's in a context of, I think I joined when policing was a, possibly a particular low point in its sort of modern journey in the sense that policing sort of was progressively drowned by new types of demand in the 60s and 70s. So all of a sudden in the 60s, people start phoning the police more and more for help rather than walking into the local police station. Then you get the pressures of organised crime and drugs and things in the 70s. And the old model of policing on the beat, and sort of every, almost everyone being a beat officer, policing sort of coming into cars, trying to be more responsive. What progressively happened then, of course, it becomes a much more reactive service. So whereas it was instinctively proactive, probably, in the sort of I know, 50s and before that, I and mean, the officer on the beat who worried about his or her largely his patch, to something that was reactive. And it was only probably part way into my career, late 90s and beyond, that policing starts thinking about actually being more intelligence-led, more thinking, more, more sort of more focused on targeting the right, right, targeting the biggest issues and getting back on the front foot. And alongside that came a load of professionalisation. But when was that? Was that in the 80s, you said? No, it was, that was that probably late 90s that change happened. There were some chiefs like John Stevens in Northumbria, who became, obviously John became commissioner of the Met sort of at the turn of the century and now Lord Stevens, David Phillips, who was chief of Kent. So people had this idea in the second half, and mid, mid to late nineties about actually how the police can get on the front foot and target the most yeah. prolific offenders, target the most prolific areas that are hotspot policing as sort of academics would call it. That really got more serious and organized probably in the, say in the middle of the nineties. But mm -hmm. when I joined the late eighties, it was, policing was still on the back foot really looking for a way out is my, Sense of it. It's interesting because that's about when I moved to the UK, 87, 88. And I remember also at the time being so surprised that most police officers didn't carry guns, right? Because of course, you know, in the States, everybody's so gunned yeah. up. And I just remember thinking, you know, here are these cops that are in the pub drinking their pints. And then what do they do? They run out and say, stop or I'll keep chasing you. And it, you know, it's just a very different, we have to be smarter in a sense when you can't rely on weapons all the time, right? Yeah, sort of. I know I I hope that never changes in the UK. I mean, I, 
we'll probably come to it, but on my watch in the sort of counterterrorism world, we increased the number of armed officers because of changing threats in about sort of 2015, 16 across the country. But we're still well, 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 well under 10% of cops are armed in the UK. And I hope we continue with that sort of very measured approach. It, it suits, I mean, I wouldn't say it was work in America for many obvious reasons, but it works very well in our context. And very few police officers get killed in this country in the line of duty, which sort of is reassuring. And the police have to use lethal force very infrequently. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a nice situation to be in. Yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. I really admire that. So yeah, so more of the real proper community policing early on before that term probably was in vogue, right? Is really exactly. what you were doing. And then you spent, let's see, the, then about 10 years later in the later 90s, as you were talking about, that's when you moved to the National Criminal Intelligence Service, right? For a couple of years. And that was one of the agencies that is now, it's now the NCA, but there was sort of, I mean, the NCA is sort of two or three iterations later than there was National Criminal Intelligence Service, there was National Crime Squad, there was a big chunk of customs and excise that did organised crime work and progressively early noughties those were amalgamated and moved on. But So I was, I was working in a bit of that machinery, first of all running the Midlands office, doing organised crime and counter-corruption operations and then running all the covert functions for that organisation, so all the sort of and a telephone interception and other sort of covert functions that were run by that agency on behalf of policing nationally. So that was a sort of having done bits of uniform and detective work and things as a sort of sergeant inspector, et cetera. This was as a detective superintendent doing that sort of thing was, was fascinating. And it also, I think having sort of moved out of West Midlands initially on secondment and seeing other police forces and other ways of doing things, it spread my horizons a bit in terms of thinking about policing. And I said, I remember sort of, say, visiting Northumbria and seeing how they were doing tasers their policing. This is sort of, 96 or 97 or something and just started to actually uh, there are some different and better ways of doing things yeah no that's important so what kinds of things in the late 90s would organize crime counter corruption what kinds of things were you focused on was it mafias uh was it prostitution was it what, what were the the bigger threats to the uk at that point the work we were doing was almost entirely revolved around drugs and a bit of firearms moving in and out of the country. It was very, very focused on drugs being the centre of organised crime. I mean, there'd be other things that'd be, I know, I know organised high-value burglaries, there'd be other sort of, I know, armed robberies and things, but the core of it probably was, probably was drugs. But corruption was a massive part of it then. Policing was, in my mind, turning the corner on counter-corruption work at that time, late 90s. And you think about commissioners previously had had a stab at corruption, but never probably quite got their hands around it as much as they want. I think, I think Robert Mark in the sort of late 70s, I think it was, was the first person to have a, have a serious stab at it. I think policing had been caught out almost by sort of the growth of organised crime and, and not having the systems and policies and structures and training and culture and a whole range of things that would defend it against organised criminals who will try and corrupt the police. And it was never that the institution was root and branch corrupt, but you had whole squads, groups of detectives, squads of detectives who would have a sort of relationship with organised crime, a sort of toxic, symbiotic mm. sort of relationship, which they would protect this organised crime group or these individuals as long as they gave them information. So they got lots of good arrests, which is probably taking out the opposition. You get these sort of mm. corrupt relationships building. It's happened in lots of countries, not just the UK. And then probably late 90s, initially under Paul Condon as commissioner, and then my old force, West Midlands and Merseyside and people at the same time followed that lead of really sort of saying, right, sort of almost like enough's enough. Mm -hmm. Let's stop pretending as a service that corruption doesn't happen. Let's be frank, of course, organised crime tries to corrupt police. We're going to put our best detectives, we're going to put our best tools and techniques on this, and we're going to root out the small number of officers who undermine us. And there were a lot of arrests in the late 90s of sort of squads of detectives in Liverpool, Birmingham, London, mm -hmm. South East Regional Crime Squad. But it sort of it, it was a privilege to be a small part of that. But it sort of I think the consequence was it completely changed the game. And at the same time, there was a tightening in some rules and systems and policies. So 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 it wasn't just about going after the dangerous individuals. It was actually about recognising actually what is it in terms of our informant handling policies that is enabling sophisticated criminals to corrupt their informant handling. But what is it about our, I don't know all the way through to things like I don't know things like gifts and hospitality or how are we working 
that isn't defending officers against this threat mm -hmm. and defending the institution against the threat. And, and it's been very, very, I think it, it, was a, it was a watershed moment that was great for policing. It was good to be, good to be part of that. And I was sort of doing that for a few years and that brought me down to, brought me down to London and sort of wife and family. And then we decided to stay in the sort of London area and then went back to mainstream policing and into, into Surrey, which was very different again and, and great fun. No, but that's really interesting about the police corruption issue because, of course, so many countries in the world, as you say, have that problem and just have, they struggle so much to root it out. And you want the police, you want people to turn to the police. That's why the absence of guns is so great because you want the police to look friendly, warm. You want people to turn to them when they have problems. And you don't want people to be afraid of the police like they are in so many countries. And so, you know, whatever you learn, I'm sure you've been using to help other countries as well, because I know a lot of people turn to the British police. They, they do, and so I, I, it did strike me sometimes. I remember around that time having hosting a visit from I can't remember which country it was. It was a pre-accession. This is the sort of stage, so sort of turn of the century. Europe's get, the European Union's getting bigger and bigger in terms of numbers of members, and there was a pre-accession states that was thinking about meeting the standards around, I guess, police and criminal justice integrity and they were visiting us and talking to them. And it, it made me realize there are different types of situation. I, and it came to conclusion, I wasn't sure I could actually help them in the sense that we'd made a lot of progress dealing with corruption because it was within a generally healthy organization. Mm -hmm. There was cancer that needs to be rooted out, but you had a generally healthy organization that wanted to get rid of it. I remember these officials from this country relaying the story where they're sort of saying, yeah, but our situation is different. The whole institution is corrupt. Right. They were saying that the way you become a customs officer in this country is you pay a bribe to get the job. Right. So you're paying your seniors a bribe to get the job. And then through taking bribes at, at, in the course of your work, you pay off the bribe you paid to your bosses to get the job in the first place. Right. So you've got a root and branch problem. So you, you don't have a majority with integrity that actually wants to sort it out. And sort of, I think that's actually a much more wicked and difficult Yeah, that's a bigger challenge, right. Than, and if you've, if you've got a sort of a, a, a majority of the organization that starts with sort of the right integrity and the right purpose. Right, right. Well, that would be an interesting subject for another podcast, perhaps. Yes. Uh, but let me ask you something, because during this period, too, I think I remember one of your predecessors in the counterterrorism role, Sir David Benes, used to say when, of course, after 9-11, he used to say, well, actually, we knew that many of these extremists Islamists were moving to the UK, they were being kicked out of their own country, or they're fleeing for their lives from their own country, and they were living in the UK. And our understanding at the time was that they were not planning attacks on the UK, that they were really more thinking about their country of origin. And so we kind of didn't bother with them because we had so many other things to worry about. Now, do you remember, Do you when you think back to that period, are there things that perhaps, I mean, we'll get to the counterterrorism bit a little bit later but i guess it would would have been in this what late eight late 90s period or would it was it even yeah, earlier? Yeah, yeah. and i wasn't I, I wasn't working in counterterrorism then but i think there is a i mean david is sort of david's a legend and he did the role i finished in for for 10 years i think from mid 90s to about 2004 or five and uh i'm sure his insights are spot on i think is sort of as i i guess look back with more recent knowledge to then i think the threat of extremist ideologies that come from all different corners of the world. I don't think I, I don't think we've been as agile as we could have been to deal with it. And frankly, I, I still and sort of will probably touch on it later. I'm as you know, I'm doing a piece of work with Sarah Khan, the Counter Extremism Commissioner, looking at our current legal framework around extremism now. And frankly, I still think it's out of date. It's not because there isn't an appetite to tackle these things and sort of perhaps there wasn't until 9-11. But they're sort of they're wickedly complicated sort of social, political, international, ethical. I mean, the, the, the dimensions of it are so difficult. But I do think that we have, in our tolerance, as a, sort of, as a country, sort of, we're proud of our tolerance, in our, sort of, I guess, in our, in our values and our behaviour. Sometimes we've tolerated those whose ambition is to undermine those values. And that's the sort of it's a really fine balance, isn't it? And you get into freedom of speech and all sorts of issues, but I, I do think we haven't always got that, haven't always got that right. So it's easy to, it's always easy to look back with lots of hindsight right, and say, right. this, with the benefit it. of hindsight, I know. And then it makes you think, well, what are we missing out today that's going to be a problem in 10, 15 years? And what could we squelch now? Of course, it's always impossible to prove 
if nothing happens that you actually did do some good preventative work too, right? Exactly. But okay, so getting back to, so let's go back to Surrey. So then you moved to, in 2000, moved to Surrey and you were chief superintendent. So how big was your beat there? So as a chief superintendent in policing, you're, you're running a big unit. It's the highest level below the executive team. So you're either, I know, you might, in those days, you might be head of CI in a force like Surrey, which had at the time maybe 2,000 officers and 1,500 police staff. You might be running a big area or you might be head of CID or something like that as a chief superintendent. So I, I was running the bottom left-hand corner of Surrey. Mm -hmm. I'm talking geographically speaking, not in any sort of bureaucracy sense. So mm -hmm. the areas sort of around Guildford and Godalming and Farnham. So it's sort of very different. And one of the reasons when, when Surrey advertised for chief superintendents and I decided to go for it, it just struck me as a, it'd be a really great experience and to do something different. Uh, sort of, I, I've enjoyed the variety of my career. And having spent sort of a decade policing Birmingham and then doing sort of um, three years or so doing national organised crime work, to go to a more sort of slightly more rural force. So, so, sorry, sort of rural with a, a, a bit of urban because of the way it's obviously that's London. And it'd be sort of great different context, and it was. And I sort of I was there for know, what, eleven or twelve years, and it was fantastic. And sort of, so I was running that sort of that corner of Surrey. So it's an area with a population of quarter of a million people roughly, had sort of several hundred officers in my command, I can't remember how many now, um, responsible for all the performance and all the policing in that area. Working for a very innovative chief constable, who subsequently became chief HMI, Sir Dennis O'Connor, who I guess you've come across a couple of times. He was a very hard and inspiring person to work for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I meant hard in a sort of, in a, in a complimentary way. And um, he was bringing some of those thoughts from the 90s in terms of, how a police force should be organised and how it can be more intelligence led and how it can do a better job serving the public, which is fascinating. And one of the things that he sort of co-led with Tim Godwin, who was an assistant commissioner in the Met at the time, was more recent iterations of community policing, neighbourhood policing as it was known. And actually, Dennis's idea was that policing had forgotten about community policing with all this reactive stuff and it had become intelligence led and started to tackle crime. But the relationship with the public still mattered, which is something that I, I sort of do strongly agree with. And okay, how do we, what does community beat policing look like in the, okay, that was the noughties compared to the Dixon of Doc Green image of history? And there was a big national program, and there were about eight forces involved eventually. And we evidenced that with the right combination of tactics, you could make a big difference to the public trust in the police and in t reducing crime in the local area. Um, it, was, it, it was evaluated to the sort of highest levels for Treasury, etc. And it generated then a sort of big investment by the mm -hmm. Labour government time across the country in, in neighbourhood policing. Sadly, it's one of those things that's had a big dent put in it over the last decade during austerity. But, but what kinds of things were you dealing with? Did you finally get around to dealing with house burglaries then? Sorry. So, so it was, yes. Your so, dream, so, your dream. So, so, so Surrey was interesting, a sort of a really weird combination of crime issues in the sense that one of the two boroughs I was responsible for was on and off the lowest crime borough in the country. So the sort of things that worried the residents there were not that serious on a sort of, on a, on a completely objective scale, but of course it mattered to them in their, in their context. So it was burglary and car theft. And there's a lot, there were a lot of issues about town centre violence, um, particularly in Guildford, that Guildford council in the 1990s had made a massive strategic error in allowing multiple disused premises to be turned into nightclubs and pubs and completely changed the character of the town centre, which then became a bit of a sort of a regional hotspot for people to go to for a night out, which then wasn't really what Guildford wanted for its town centre in terms of the sort of what it created. So you had those sorts of issues. So I guess classic county force stuff, for want of a better description. But then you had a massive issue with travelling criminals, particularly from London. Mm -hmm. When I became chief of surrey sort of 2008 one of my big themes then was about trying to sort that out and i remember then looking at some data and it was something like 45 percent of surrey's more serious crime was being committed by offenders from london but were they traveling through or coming in to do crime and then leaving again the latter yeah so coming in and going out again and why were they going there what what, what was so special about Which pickings? So if you're a criminal living in southwest London, then sort of, I know, head down the A3 and target Surrey was what the conclusion was. It's quite, quite easy to do. And of course, 
that's quite, it's quite an unusual policing problem to have. Imagine where almost half of your criminal problem is something you don't understand very well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we sort of try to improve intelligence liaison with the mayor. We brought officers into some of the intelligence units there. We did a whole load of work with AMPR. And so in terms of trying, was trying to create a sort of technical ring of steel around, sort of along that northern border, sort of northeastern border of the county. So, so there's a whole load of stuff we did to try and tackle that. Because if 90% of your problem is homegrown, mm-hmm. if you target, you, you can almost ignore the 10%. I know that sounds like if you target the 90%, if you make a big impact on that, you can have right. a big impact on the whole. Right. If nearly half of it is not homegrown, then actually you've got, to, you've got to have a strategy for that half that is not homegrown. And that's really different. And it's interesting now I reflect on it. And some of that was drugs related. I mean, you look at county lines now, some of it was drugs related. And sort of one of the things I, I drove as a chief then was I insisted that every year we had a target in terms of the number of drugs supply prosecutions we were going to do for the class. And, and my reason for sort of keeping a sort of force like Surrey focused on organised crime was just the intelligence picture. You could see what would happen would be a precursor of the county lines today. You get drugs networks in sort of South London trying to establish a base in, I know, in, in, in Rygate or in, in, in Dorking or in uh, Woking or wherever. And they might get into a flat. They might sort of bully a vulnerable person out of a council flat and take it over. Those sort of, and it always struck me actually if we were if we ran a sort of undercover operations and various covert operations, we would kept the pressure. Well, it's just a war of attrition. If we kept arresting mm-hmm. a sufficient number of drug dealers every year, it's not that we would win, mm-hmm. but we would keep the balance that it was not an easy place for them to operate. Mm-hmm. Whereas if we took the eye off the ball for a couple of years, then it would get far more established and far harder to push back. And I sort of, that was a much easier precursor of the problem today, which has got more sophisticated, I guess, because of telecommunications and other means where the county lines problem now, where you've got the drugs, organised crime problems in big cities, um, not just London, but it happens elsewhere around the country, as you know, being exported to neighbouring areas. And it sort of really illustrates the need for policing to be, ever more joined up well that's the challenge isn't it with you know with the police force in the uk with how many separate entities are there so 43 in england and wales one in (laughs) scotland um yeah so those 43 i mean it's still pretty joined up compared to many countries i suppose you've got countries like holland okay smaller country which has gone to a national police force and scotland which i think is good Um, but then you've got the other end of the spectrum you've got america i know it's four or five times bigger but it's got seventeen thousand law enforcement agencies i mean that's With due respect to Americans, that's bonkers um, in the modern in the modern world. Yeah, I know. But, that's um, what you can't fix these problems with the you know racism in the police force or whatever just by coming up with a national strategy, right? It has to go at so many different levels. Uh, exactly, and I I think that's sort of if we go down that brief tangent a bit further, if you look at in the UK across those forty three forces, there are lots of collaborations between forces to tackle joint issues under legal vehicles. Mm-hmm. We've had since I think about the 1850s an inspectorate, an independent inspectorate of constabulary. So you've got HMIC, FCRS, whatever its ridiculous acronym is now, that's, that's annually looking at all the police forces. You've got College of Policing producing legally enforceable standards on critical areas of policing. You've got national approaches to training. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of checks and balances on an individual chief constable. I, I sort of, I didn't mind that as a chief constable. Like occasionally, occasionally, of course, it can generate bits of friction and you get irritated, but. In, in the round, it's actually about maintaining standards and having checks and balances and accountabilities mm-hmm. to a national approach. Mm-hmm. In America, it seems to me pretty much none of that exists either at a national or a state level. And sort of whether you reduce the number of police forces or mandate and drive interoperability and standards, there are different ways to fix the problem. But I think you can't run a credible modern police force that's smaller than several thousand people in terms of officers, just because of all the specialisms you need, the, the complexity of training. I mean, on the one hand, training a detective who's going to be expert in forensics and investigation things, and then training a firearms officer, training a, someone who's going to be able to deal with vulnerable victim, victims of vulnerable crime, dealing with the victims of sexual abuse. And that's, I mean, these are all sort of wickedly difficult individual disciplines. Building expertise across all of that and the ability to sort of maintain and sustain that as an institution. You can't do that in, a, in an organisation of 10 or 50 or even 100 people. You've got to be quite, quite big to do it. And that's, that's driven more and more collaboration in the UK. And I think that's, that when I look at America and its sort of trials and tribulations around policing at the moment, 
course, there are some bad apples in the barrel like there are in any organisation. But it, it's more, I think, about probably got lots of people joining with the best of intent. It's more about the institution and how it trains and develops and supports them and, and, and the culture set by leaders and all the rest of it. That, that's the critical issue. Yeah, no. Which is in some of the debate. Maybe the Biden administration will. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> listen, I mean, I think that's a conversation for another podcast. I mean, don't forget yeah. that also some of these police forces end up getting these weapons from, you know, that were left over from Afghanistan. So they get over militarized too, which even sends always the wrong message to the community. So there's lots of good things to be grateful about the system in the UK. And as you say, there's no system that's probably perfect. Uh, and you can make the best of a very loose federation and try to impose standards, or you can try to centralize it more. And it's not clear, you know, what if it would be a benefit or not. I'm sure there are plenty of people who spend a lot of time thinking about that. But let's sort of, so you did that for about 11, 12 years, Surrey, and then uh, you did a few years at the border agency. And then you switched to specialist crime and operations, became assistant commissioner at the Met. Uh, you oversaw the policing of a number of high profile events, such as the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, Margaret Thatcher's funeral, the 2012 Olympics. You launched a new approach to gangs. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Can we maybe unpick a bit of those experiences? No, I, so, that, so going into the Met was, um, was great. I sort of, I, I'd, I've been chief of, sorry, for four years, but I sort of, it was time for me to move on. And sort of, someone Were you living say, in Surrey oh. or did you stay in London? So I, I've always I've always lived in the west side of London near Surrey. So okay. sort of I didn't, so didn't, so personally, I didn't, personally didn't move. It's just a, a, piece, a, sort of a, a little sort of, um, a sort of more amusing sort of anecdote. So the first police force I applied to when I was at Cambridge was the Met Police. So this is in 1986. Mm -hmm. And they turned me down because they said I was too blind to be a police officer. Too blind? Too blind, yeah. So my eyes aren't great. So, so that's so. So I spent a few months shopping round, frankly, and um, discovered that the West Midlands were more generous in their standards. Which is, and so rather than coming to London, where my uh, sort of university friends and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, was coming to sort of work in London. So rather than ending up in London, which is my plan, I ended up back in Birmingham, which is where I was from, which which was great experience. I don't regret it, but sort of. That is interesting to me. Having been sort of turned down by the Met in 1986 for being too blind to be a police officer, <laughs> it felt nice to be finally sort of finally, it, from a personal perspective, writing that wrong and persuading them that maybe I could. Or, but then it, you might take a view as an assistant commissioner, it doesn't matter if you're blind. But that's a, and, that's a, and I would imagine your eyesight was far worse at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so and we all suffer from that age issue, probably, don't we? But I was arriving at a time almost all the command team of the Met was changing at the end, sort of, at the sort of second half of 2011. You'd had the public scandal and concern around hacking, and you'd had an, an, an all that's generated a whole load of things that's followed that, not least the collapse of News of the World and, and what have you. Um, but there were questions about the relationships of police leaders to journalists, and also you had the riots in 2011, sort of which started in London, which was fairly ghastly. So I, I was arriving as part of a sort of a, a new senior team in the Met, and I picked up working to sort of Bernard Hogan Howe, great person to work with. And I picked up the portfolios around pretty much all the specialist functions that wasn't the sort of terrorism world. So if you divided sort of the operations of the Met into three chunks, the sort of all the local policing units, so the, the 32 borough units that were across London, terrorism, and then everything, all the other so specialist stuff. So dealing with, dealing with public order, the firearms teams, organized crime, fraud, the, the rape investigation, the rape and sexual so that, so that whole range. It was a sort of great portfolio, and having sort of, I guess, done some specialist policing, but then in, in sorry, does bits of specialist policing, specialist policing, but it's more going to be central on community. It was great to get back into the specialist world again, and there's some really big challenges. So sort of obviously there's the post riots issue of gangs and sort of mm -hmm. sort of getting on top of gangs, and we we did a whole load of new initiatives around changing the shape of Operation Trident, which had been the Mets gang initiative for some time. And sort of, as the threat changes, you always need to sort of iterate what your response is. And so it was the next iteration of, of Trident. We made sort of aggressive use of new tactics, like sort of lots of you know, gang injunctions and civil orders and things like that. We ran a lot of covert operations, so sort of taking apart gangs through drugs operations. And sort of over my tenure in that, I was pleased. So my, the last year I was there, 2014, I think is the, is the lowest year of murders in the Met on record. That was the year it dipped under 100 murders, which is 
fantastic. So we made a big, we made a big dent on, on gangs in that iteration. Likewise, was dealing with issues such as thinking about public order policing, and actually, not only had we had the riots the year before, mm-hmm. but there'd been three or four times previously where over the previous few years where public order situations have gone wrong in London, you had the student protests and Millbank, et cetera, you'd had G20 and, and one or two others. And so we thought about different approaches, mm-hmm. had a really good team there, we thought about different approaches to public order policing and interesting brought, brought a community policing element to public order policing, which I was really proud of. The idea being that if you can have, you'll see them on, if you see the, what's the videos in public order and sort of big protests and big events now, you'll see a few officers in blue tabards who are there to, they're there to try and liaise with the organisers of the event. What's and a tabard? A t- tabard, like a, um, like a gilet, blue g- gilet mm, mm. type thing. Sort of, um, so to mark them out as different. And so mm-hmm. the purpose of that is to recognise that on most protests, you've got a lot of people there who are coming to sort of exercise their democratic right. They're not coming for any trouble whatsoever. The challenge is you'll get a small cohort of people who want to create merry hell. If you can have a better relationship with the sort of organisers at the centre of the majority, that means it's more likely that if you need to intervene and arrest some or take on some of the troublemakers, you can do that in a more surgical way and not draw in everybody else into it and sort of have, have that escalation effect. So you're trying to maintain the support of the majority while you deal with the sort of criminal minority. And so that was a, that's been, I think that's been a really sort of powerful initiative. So thinking about things like that, about public order and different tactics, and also working through the sort of legacy of the shooting of Mark Duggan and planning for the inquest on, on that and trying to build public confidence in the Met's police use of firearms, which that isn't me saying I thought there was anything fundamentally wrong with it. Mm-hmm. It was more about how do you explain police use of force? And we did a lot of work in terms of, again, being more transparent with the public and we had lots of journalists start coming in to sort of go on the sort of training range with firearms, sort of judge, judgment range, where it's, and sort of helping people understand the challenges police officer faces and, and building that understanding actually about the real care around firearms officers. I mean, and when you looked at the statistics, I was proud and amazed when you looked at how many officers armed officers how many incidents a, a year armed officers in London were being sent to how often they were drawing the weapons and 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 confronting suspects and then how often shots were fired I mean it was, it was extra, I mean sort of I think I remember a statistic it was something like pretty much every day or so an officer was drawing a weapon going into a situation and yet shots were being fired once or twice a year it just reached the, so the, the level of care and professionalism and judgment I think mean, the benefit of our firearms model, I'm not, you can't translate it to every other country, but if you've only got a small cohort of people trained who carry weapons, you can train them to a much higher level. So their ability to, under massive pressure, make fine judgments and get them right, is, is bound to be better. It's like, right. it's like any, anything you practice, anything, particularly, I, I'm not trying to make a trivial comparison with a sport, but anything that's about sort of, Fine, rapid judgments and motor control. Right, of course. The more you practice it, the better, better you get at those decisions. And so, dealing with those sorts of issues was uh, was great. And so, and, but the organised crime and the gangs was probably the the biggest. Well, no, really interesting period. And then, then I met you after that job because I met you probably about early 2015, early 2016, when you were then national police lead for counterterrorism, assistant commissioner of the Met. Yeah. And here is when uh, I think the the Islamic State inspired terrorist attacks went kind of bonkers basically. And you know, Islamic State didn't really even exist till that period. It was obviously, as we know, outgrowth of the US invasion of Iraq and then of course the Syrian civil war. And then they just managed somehow to inspire people from all corners of the globe, not only to come out there and join that so called caliphate, but also to conduct attacks back home. And so then we saw all of a sudden, you know, we were dealing with Al Qaeda inspired attacks which were you know, of course, we had the 7-7 bombings. We had a few things in the UK. But once the Islamic State came on the scene, it really upped the game. Uh, and they were able to radicalize people so quickly online within a matter of days instead of the weeks and months that it used to take through peer-to-peer grooming. And so that really must have changed your job in a significant way. I mean, I, I, sort, of, I sort of knew I'd stepped into a, 
a developing sort of storm. It was slightly bizarre timing. I took over that that post, which as you say, it's an unusual post. You're part of the top team at Scotland Yard, but you've also got a national responsibility. And sort of day one was fine. Day two, my second day in the post was the day that Baghdadi declared the caliphate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which sort of, that was in June twenty with June twenty fifteen. June twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen, yeah. Yeah, June twenty fourteen. So so that was a sort of I want to no, I'll be I'll be polite. That was a bit of a crikey moment. Um <laughs> in terms of sort of like this 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 feels different. And then throughout the four years so in that in that post, that sort of storm sort of was building and building and building and as, exactly as you describe it. I, I suppose my reflection on it going back is what ISIS really changed in terms of terrorism was they made terrorism open source mm-hmm. and it, it's not that I mean, so some others before them had messed around with this a bit the way i see it, if you take a simplistic look back in history previously terrorist groups whether you look at i don't know the ira or al-qaeda were more about secret groups secret networks and careful recruitment and, and sort of it wasn't purely that but that's the broad pattern of it and then you get isis which have flipped it to yeah, we'll still have our secret network and we'll plan some big, try and plan some big attacks. And we saw I don't know, some ghastly things in, in places like Paris. But, but actually, we'll put a lot of effort just into open source, inspiring of others to act sort of in our name, um, in our support. And that, that, of course, wouldn't have been possible before I don't know, 2010 or 11 or, or whatever. Sort of you, you needed the growth of social media and modern communications to be really sort of ubiquitous for that to be possible. But they were the first ones probably to really convert it at scale. And that's spawned a similar approach from the right wing, which I'm sure we'll probably come to. But sort of even though that's a more fragmented bottom up sort of terrorist threat, it's sort of it's using some of the same methodology. But in terms of terrorism, it's turned terrorism from a terrorism to, to counterterrorism has sort of become a it's almost become a volume issue. Right. And this the historic models for dealing with terrorism are based on you manage a small caseload, you throw lots of resources at it, you prioritise that small caseload, and you can do very, very well. Actually, all of a sudden, you've got these big, big numbers. I mean, you hear the, my successor, Neil Basu, and Ken McCullum at MI5 talking about, and I think more, is it 20 or 30,000, I can't remember the number now, of people who are sort of on the, who are still of concern, have been part of operations previously, and this sort of, this residual penumbra of risk around the core operations. And those numbers are, are massive you wouldn't have had 10 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago you people police officers and um security service leaders wouldn't have been thinking in that sort of scale and numbers and that sort of problem and so it's a, and it generates a completely different sort of set of problems and as we've heard recently the other two talking about how it then gets to the vulnerable and i think is it sort of 1500 or more sort of um under 18s being refer, referred to prevent in 18 months those are sort of horrific numbers, but that only comes through sort of this open source terrorism. It's a, it's a really wicked It's a huge issue. challenge, right. Right. And as you say, we have these concentric circles where some people maybe we assume are more radicalized than others, but you don't always know what it can take from one person on the outer edge to travel closer to the epicenter. And then the police get blamed when they say, well, we were actually monitoring that person. Well, you're monitoring a lot of people. <laughs> And the fact that you actually had your eye on that person should be considered a success rather than a failure, given the volume yeah. that you're talking about. And I think that's a problem. I think that the perception problem people don't always understand. I mean, you, you managed to foil a number of plots, you know, probably, you know, 75 to 100 bigger ones, and I'm sure many smaller ones. Um, but you don't really get credit for that. It's just the ones that get through. And then, then I mean, I, I think actually people understand that the threat is so uh, so democratized, is so diffuse right now that it's impossible to police them all. We've just seen in France uh, three or four attacks in the spate of a, a few weeks. Somebody got beheaded, then we had the, you know, a couple of attacks outside of a church. As you know, I'm at the moment doing a piece of work with Sarah Khan, the counter-extremism commissioner, on sort of legal powers around extremism. And I wanted to sort of assist and work with Sarah when I left policing largely because of this wider issue about extremism because what what struck me when I left policing in 2018 and left that sort of counterterrorism role was the UK has a very very good counterterrorism machinery that's not to have any arrogance it's been developed over decades 
there's lots of good people who have, have made a big difference in that in that space. Different governments sort of left and right over decades have had to confront terrorist issues, legal powers have been changed, investments have been developed, security intelligence agencies have improved their capabilities, it's relatively as of the police. The, the agencies, big agencies tend to be bad at working together, that's uh, incidents in history have forced people to confront that and get past that and build close relationships. So if you've been kicked around by terrorism as the UK has for sort of I don't know, five or more decades, then actually it should produce a really good infrastructure and it's always going to be scope to improve and you can always learn lessons. But what struck me leaving that world was the recruiting pool for, te for terrorism, if you like, the world of extremism that is normalizing terrorist ideas and creating the next band of recruits. It also plays into other social ills like people's life chances, like you know, growth in hate crime. There isn't much of an infrastructure to deal with extremism. There isn't clear legal powers, the resources aren't anywhere near as good. And actually, that's sort of what's generating, say, some of these recent press commentary from, from Neil Basu about what we've got 15 or 1700 children sort of every six months, 18, 18 months, mm -hmm. and nearly 100, 100, 100 children a month being referred to prevent. But that shows that that infrastructure isn't there at that extremism level. And so, hence, doing this piece of work with Sarah, where we're looking at the particular question is the legal question which loops back into the thing we've been talking about around, I guess, freedom of speech and the sort of French example. It's really hard to stretch the legislation further because of the sensitivities around freedom of speech, which of course we have to absolutely protect. But we'll be reporting in January. It's, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that the amount of ghastly material and behavior that's out there that is legal, that I think we will present in January, will make people sort of raise their eyebrows and actually actually we do need some new legal methods to do with this and we're sort of we're going to make some suggestions about how you can start to get there that's that's what we're trying to do because i think it's it's it overlaps with the sort of issues that macron and france are wrestling with mm -hmm. at the moment no oh, interesting and I, my understanding is during the pandemic there's even more concern about youngsters getting radicalized because they're all trapped at home and they're all on their computers exactly. all day and some of their parents just aren't around to to be helping because they're doing their own thing and trying to keep up or you know, worried about unemployment, etc. So, oh dear. Well, I, in a sense, maybe you're slightly relieved you retired when you did. No, not at all. No, it was just it was it, retirement was there was sort of one of those moments. I think actually, yeah, it's time for me to do something, do something mm -hmm. different. When you're still young um, enough to to build another portfolio. Still, still hard to be young enough to do that. But sort of, it was uh, it was the right time to leave. But sort of, and I, I I wanted to, and as you know, I went off and did a, a range of bizarre things like trekking to Everest Base Camp and going to a yoga retreat and various things like that to sort of blow away the cobwebs. And did it work so, or did you get re-stressed out the second you got back? <laughs> no, it worked actually. It was, it was part of it. But I think sort of when you've done a role which is literally 24-7, 365 in terms of being sort of pretty much permanently on duty, on call, and I would not want to imply any sense that I want anybody to feel sorry for me, far from it. It was a mm -hmm. great privilege. It was very rewarding how demanding it was um, and I'd, I'd do the same thing again but actually to coming down from that it's a sort of I jokingly said to somebody I'm not sure I said this on the podcast but I'm going to say it now I sort of I joke said to me at one stage I said oh, I wonder if this is what it's like coming off if you've, you've been mainlining heroin on a daily basis and you stop I wonder if this is what it feels like in the sense that sort of yeah that, the rush the rush, that rush of the, 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 the permanent adrenaline and then you step back from it that it's a it's an interesting thing but I, I sort of actually it's having sort of been in policing pretty much since I left university. It's um, right. it's great to have a more variety of things. I'm doing some interesting work with some technology companies. I do some advisory work with Deloitte. So I've done a bit of international work. I say do some more sort of thinking work, working with yourself and with sort of SARA counter extremism commission, etc. And that's all that's fantastic. And it's sort of it's it's it, so it's an interesting new chapter, and I'm enjoying that breadth and diversity of pursuits compared to what I did before. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And it's great that you were able to take a few months off and just de-stress because uh, everyone has different ways of de-stressing. Some are healthier than others. And I always think exercise is a more healthy way to de-stress de -stress than, than, what, than people who use substances, et cetera. So um, we'll look as, you know, there's still so much to talk about, but we are running out of time. And I do want to ask just a few more questions before I ask the last one, which is about, you know, advice for young, young people as they're about to start uh, their next career. And by the way, we also should congratulate you when you were knighted in 2018 
really for the exceptional contribution that you have made to national security and uh, the leadership that you provided, uh, especially during some of these really ghastly attacks in 2017. And so absolutely deserve huge congratulations on that. But I, I guess, you know, on, on a sort of a bigger, at a bigger level, if you look back through your, through your career and you look back about the threats and the challenges that you faced, is there any way to say in a few sentences how the threat landscape has changed in the UK? Is that too simplistic of a question? No, oh, that's, that's probably an, an essay to answer that one. Um, I suppose there's, a, there's something about international connectivity and whether you look at sort of the issues Lynn Owens is wrestling with in sort of unorganised crime at the NCA or, or, or terrorism or other threats, it is so much more internationally connected than ever it's faster moving and it's more complex i suppose if you sort of looked at business so go away from crime to business business has developed in that way businesses are more global more connected faster moving more and more complex sophisticated products more sort of and and sort of crime and terrorism and other threats move in the same way as business does it's slightly more organic and chaotic but the same drift. so so that's the that's the challenge. And, and I think the issue for law enforcement security in the UK and globally is it's hard for the state to move as fast. Right. It's true with business, isn't it? Government struggle, as, as businesses morph and change, governments struggle to work out how to encourage the good and how to regulate the sort of things they want to sort of contain and control. And I think in this space, government is exactly the same. National governments struggle more and more and national forces, agencies, struggle to keep pace with that and it's a wickedly difficult balance because on the one hand we want public services that are countable and careful with public money and don't take undue risks and are have a fair degree of bureaucracy to ensure accountability to the law and, and parliament and all those sorts of types of issues so you want all of that wrapped around them for lots of good reasons but it makes them less agile than criminals frankly or terrorists or other threats to national security. And I think that's the conundrum. I always had a sense that more innovation was possible. And the thing I've seen most from outside policing is, and government for that matter, the potential of technology to innovate, to help innovation, is so far ahead of what is being exploited. Right. For a combination of those bureaucratic rules that slow down procurement, some for good reason, some for bad reason, the lack of understanding in the system of what products are out there, the nervousness around working with small tech companies that sort of leads you to working with slightly less agile, big, more old-fashioned companies. There's a whole range of different factors in there. And if I look at some of the technologies being deployed in the banking sector to deal with financial crime, some of it is extraordinary. It's way above what's been deployed in law enforcement to deal with the same threats. So I think that, that agility is a real, real problem. And I say, and technology is at the centre of it, and, and I think we have to find a different way of doing that. I'm sitting on a mission for smart government at the moment, which is sort of chaired by Nick Herbert, which is looking at this issue amongst others about how, how you actually change, change the game in terms of the ability of the public sector to be that agile. Because I think the agility plays back into the threats, and if we can't fix that, it will always be tough to keep pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I know we could talk about this for many more hours, but we do have to end. Let me just say for the last question about, this is something I ask everybody, is really advice to younger people who are thinking about their career choices. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work in the past with underprivileged youngsters, um, helping with leadership, social responsibility. I know part of the reason you joined the police is to help people out of bad situations. So what, what advice would you have really for anybody these days thinking about what their career path is going to be. Would you recommend they join the police? Would you recommend they work in government? Would you recommend they go work for a tech company? What kind of recommend? Well, yeah, I'm sure people ask you all the time too. So I, my, my kids are now in the twenties and working, you've heard me say this sort of many times. So I think in terms of choosing your career, there's a Steve Jobs quote, which I think is the best on the subject. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's, I think, at the heart of it for me is actually sort of that, that sense of 
is this really is this great work I'm doing? Is it really important? Now, I don't. There's not one place to find that. It's not about public sector or private sector or third sector. You can find it in any of those places. But I think that's what you have to itch for. If you're attracted to policing, that I think that quote resonates with me because that's the experience I had in policing. I loved what I did, did then. I love what I do now. But that 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 career was such a great choice from say walking the beat in Birmingham to being responsible for the counterterrorism sort of policing machinery across the country. I, I had that that sense of purpose and value, and that's what you have to look for. If you're if you're a young person attracted to policing, though, go for it. It's the most amazing. Um, most amazing profession and and great fun and good luck. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That's very thoughtful. A very thoughtful answer. Uh, Sir Mark Rally, thank you so much for your time today. Really grateful for your insights, for sharing your thoughts on your career and for offering advice to the next generation. Karen, thank you very much. I've enjoyed chatting. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We always appreciate any comments, positive or negative please email them to us or tweet us at rusi underscore org or hashtag in context. All the podcasts are on the Rusi website, so please do go back and listen to any of the ones that you have missed and send us comments. This podcast was produced by Tom Ascott, developed by Caroline Tranter, with further research from Neil Watling. Keep up to date with the latest defense and security analysis by visiting www.rusi.org.